Welcome everyone. It looks as if we have a number of people beginning to join the session. We're going to give everyone a couple minutes to filter into the room and we'll begin about two minutes after 12. We have about a quarter of the attendees that we're expecting this afternoon. We're going to give them just a couple more minutes and we'll begin in two minutes. We have a little steady stream of people joining us. I'm just going to give one more minute and then we'll get started. Thank you so much for your patience. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Children's Research Fund Back to School panel discussion. I'm Christy Stappis, Chairman of the Children's Research Fund. It's nice to have so many of our volunteer board members with us today, along with more than 200 guests. For 69 years, education has been at the center of the Children's Research Fund mission. Our research education agenda for 2020 is designed to help parents guardians and caregivers better navigate these uncertain times. In collaboration with our partners at the Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago, the Stanley Manny Children's Research Institute, and the soon to be announced Patrick M. Magoon Institute for Healthy Communities, we have created this panel discussion to address the many questions that we all have as our kids, toddlers to college students, begin their school year. Now I'd like to introduce a fellow board member, Kathy Graham, the Children's Research Fund Chair of Research Education. Kathy? Thanks so much, Christy, and welcome everyone. Thanks for taking time to join us. It's my really great pleasure and honor to introduce our panelists today. Um, first off, Dr. Derek Wheeler is the Chief Medical Officer uh, at Lurie's and also the Crown Family Pro Professor of Pediatrics at Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine. 
His area of focus is critical care, and he attended Indiana University School of Medicine and completed a fellowship in pediatric critical care at Cincinnati Children's, as well as doing his residency at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego. Next up will be then Dr. John Walker, and he's the department head of the Pritzker Department of Psychiat Psychiatry and Behavioral Health at Lurie and holds the Margaret C. Osterman Board Designated Professorship in Children and Adolescent Psychiatry. He's also a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the medical, uh, at Northwestern's med uh, medical school. He's an international authority on Tourette syndrome and has extensive experience as a principal investigator in the treatment trials for children and adolescent psychopathy, including anxiety and mania disorders. He attended the University of Minnesota, my home state medical school, and did fellowship and residency at Yale New Haven Hospital. And then finally, we have Dr. Jill Larson, and she's an attending physician in orthopedic surgery, as well as an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at Northwestern's uh, Medical School. She completed her medical training at Northwestern and uh, concluded training at Boston Children's Hospital um, and Harvard. She specializes in the treatment of all pediatric orthopedic conditions, but has a particular focus in the management of neuromuscular, hip, and spine pathologies, in addition to the treatment of lower extremity deformity. So I'm gonna turn it over first to uh, Dr. Derek Wheeler to go through his comments. All right, good afternoon, everybody. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, I wanna thank you all for attending and um, I'm thrilled to be here with Drs. Walkup and Larson uh, to really speak to you about the emerging evidence and some of the questions, and there are a lot, uh, on COVID-19 in children, particularly as it relates to the decision on whether to return to school or not. So um, just the mandatory disclaimer, we will not provide recommendations on whether schools should open or close. And I, I think the reason for that is that um, it is a, a really difficult question. Uh, certainly we don't know the right answer. Uh, I would tell you that the experts don't know the right answer and the evidence really is all over the place, uh, both for and against. Um, there's, there's really no clear cut guidance um, and a lot of um, public health departments really have recommended that it should be a local decision because not only is the disease prevalence very different from region to region, but uh, the capabilities of school systems uh, vary widely as well. Uh, really, there's, there's multiple reasons on either side. Uh, you know, certainly we know that U.S. school closures uh, translate to lost learning for kids. Um, you know, everybody hears about the uh, summer slide. So when kids uh, break off uh, over summer vacation, uh, when they return to school in the fall, they usually uh, have a little bit of a, a, a deficit and they have to catch up a little bit. And uh, certainly uh, the evidence would suggest that during the school closures, even with remote learning, uh, there was an, a bit of an exaggerated summer slide. Uh, and what the statistics would tell you is that um, school disruptions for other things like teacher strikes uh, are really um, associated with significant uh, adverse impacts on, on school uh, long-term learning. Even to the point where some studies have suggested that the projected annual income loss from a teacher strike and the loss of school uh, is two to three percent over a student's lifetime. So very significant. Uh, we've also, um, there was a study that looked at uh, school closures during COVID-19 this past spring uh, and winter, and the estimate was that it would result in a $2.5 trillion loss in future earnings for kids. Uh, again, that's due to that um, loss of, of development and all the, the significant advantages that kids have uh, for being in school and, and learning in school. We also know that school uh, closures can really adversely impact the long-term health of kids. Uh, certainly, uh, there's been a lot of focus on um, the, the decreased physical activity as, as kids have sheltered in place uh, during the school closures over the um, spring. Um, there's certainly the loss of social interaction, and, and I think that really uh, is critically important, particularly for the younger kids. Uh, and, and so you don't get that certainly with remote learning. 
there's lots of support for, for children with special health care needs. Uh, they're really, a lot of those children are dependent upon the services that are provided in their school systems uh, for, for some of their, their special health care needs. And then really, uh, in, in some cases, kids are dependent upon uh, school and going to school for their access to food. Uh, so really, there's, there's issues from a nutritional standpoint where, where kids are um, not able to take advantage of uh, breakfast and, and school lunches, and that may be their um, biggest source of nutrition. So uh, there's, there's a lot of reasons that it can adversely impact cool, uh, kids uh, from a long-term health perspective. And then lastly, it really um, has shown that um, school closures affect a parent's ability to work. Uh, and certainly, um, most recently, the 12-week school closure uh, during COVID-19, again in the fall and in the spring, they estimated that there was a, about $128 billion uh, lost productivity revenue uh, from parents who had to take off to, to, in order to provide child care for their kids. One study even looked at um, healthcare workers, and um, there was a 19% reduction uh, in healthcare workers uh, being able to come in uh, to work. Uh, and so, really, there's there's a, a suggestion that potentially um, our healthcare workers who are taking care of all these patients with COVID-19 may not actually be able to come to work because they have to um, deal with childcare issues. So, there's really a whole host of reasons why um, you know closing schools or, or keeping schools closed really can impact uh, the society in a lot of uh, uh, significant ways. You, you balance that really with the obvious concerns about um, children getting infected with COVID-19 uh, or uh, as, you know, as even transmitting COVID-19 uh, to uh, parents or other family members. So, and, and those are certainly not trivial uh, cons um, considerations. I mean, I think those are really big concerns for a lot of parents uh, and for a lot of teachers, frankly. Um, so really, uh, th this editorial uh, in, in one of the recent studies that I actually will um, uh, review quickly, uh, the decision to reopen schools during the fall of 2020 is among the greatest challenges that the U.S. has faced in generations. And I would say that's absolutely true. We really don't know what the right answer is, and, and that's why I think you're seeing a lot of uh, school systems continue to struggle with this decision uh, because it is a, a really difficult one. We want to make sure that um, kids can go back to school safely, uh, but we also want to make sure that we take advantage of all the great things of, of having schools open uh, and, and the benefits to society from that standpoint, not only short term, but long term as well. So, you know, I, I think a lot of that I've mentioned that um, it's really a local decision. And, and so uh, I just really like to review very briefly uh, our experience here in the city of Chicago with COVID-19. And this is uh, data that was um, up to date as of yesterday, I believe. Uh, and you can see that um, really 6% um, of all uh, the patients uh, that have tested positive for COVID-19 in the city of Chicago have been in the pediatric age group. So that zero to 17 year old age group. Uh, it, so it it's really seems to be a disease that um, impacts adults uh, to a much greater extent uh, than children. And even the severity uh, of, of COVID-19 in, in, in these patients is much more severe in adults as opposed to children. And certainly that's, that's been our experience here at Lurie Children's Hospital. That's been our experience uh, in the state of Illinois. And, and really that's, that's been the experience worldwide. Um, this, this is just really, you know, not a significant um, pediatric illness, uh, which is surprising. Whoops, went back, skipped one. So, um, and, and that evidence is here. So again, this is the number of deaths from COVID. And so we've only really in the city of Chicago have only had two children that have died uh, from COVID-19 or complications related to COVID-19. So um, uh, even, you know, there's been a lot of media attention on the multi-inflammatory uh, disease or MISC. Um, that's, even that is, is fairly rare. Um, we're not seeing a lot of that here at Lurie Children's Hospital. Um, and, and the numbers in, in terms of uh, comparison to kids that um, are at home with COVID-19 versus the ones that um, get admitted to the hospital um, it, it's, it's a really significant mismatch. So uh, relatively mild illness uh, in kids, thankfully. So um, these are some of the statistics here from Lurie Children's Hospital, and this is uh, 
hopefully we'll address some of the questions that we received uh, uh, before the, the presentation. So we've um, almost conducted 15,000 tests uh, here at Lurie Children's Hospital, and we've had 778 children that have tested positive uh, throughout this pandemic. So about 5.4% of all the tests that have been performed at Lurie Children's Hospital have been positive tests. We um, probably the beginning of April, we started routinely testing everybody before they had any surgical procedure. And so those were patients that by and large were coming in asymptomatic. So the only reason that they were getting a test was because we were trying to clear them before surgery. And so um, we've tested uh, almost 5,000 patients uh, for that reason, and we've only had 114 test positive. So about 2.3% uh, of those patients who have been relatively asymptomatic um, that have tested positive. And that, again, is, is data that has been very consistent across the board in, in most studies that have been reported in the literature. So um, this study uh, received a lot of attention in the lay press. Um, it was reported on the news. It was reported in uh, several newspapers, including the Wall Street Journal. It was a study performed by some coll former colleagues of mine at Cincinnati Children's Hospital uh, that really looked at the impact of uh, school closure uh, on COVID-19 incidents and mortality in the United States. And what they found is that uh, school closures uh, actually were effective in lowering the incidence of COVID-19 in all comers, not just kids, but adults as well, and, and the mor mortality risk as well. The problem with this particular study and, and what is not frequently reported in the lay press and what you don't hear about in the news is they really didn't control for all the other things that were happening at the same time. So if you remember back uh, to early, um, you know, middle of March, kind of early April, uh, in addition to shutting down all of our schools, we were shutting down all of our businesses. Uh, we started instituting universal masking. Restaurants were closed. Public places were closed. The streets were really uh, very quiet. Um, you know, here in Chicago, they shut down the lakefront, uh, they shut down all the public parks. So all of that was, was occurring across the country, uh, and, and none of that was taken into consideration in this study. So to, to be able to um, say that school closure had the primary or the, the, the direct impact on incidents of COVID-19 and mortality um, is probably not completely true. Uh, because it, 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 there were really so many other things that we did uh, to address uh, COVID-19 at the time. Uh, so I, I think it's an interesting study. It's, it's one that we should pay attention to, uh, but unfortunately I think um, uh, was probably over uh, interpreted uh, in, the, in, the, in the media. And this is a study that we performed here at Lurie Children's Hospital that again, a, a few people asked questions about that actually was released the same day as um, that previous study uh, that really looked at age-related differences in uh, the number of virus particles that children had. And what it showed is that um, children younger than five years of age, even with mild to moderate uh, symptoms of COVID-19, have relatively high uh, viral counts. Uh, and so that's concerning. Um, it would suggest that potentially kids can transmit this virus but that wasn't something that was studied. So uh, Dr. Larry Kosiolik and, and Dr. Uh, Taylor Held Sargent uh, were the two main investigators of this particular study. And, and what they have um, uh, explained to me and they've explained uh, to the media when they've, they've been interviewed is that this study, while interesting, um, really doesn't tell us a whole lot about whether these kids were um, effectively transmitting uh, the virus to uh, their family members or to other children. So um, again, while an interesting study, there is so much that we don't know about this particular virus. Um, there is so much that we are learning uh, and continue to learn about this particular virus, uh, which makes it really difficult to, um, to answer questions definitively. I would say that, um, you know, this virus is a typical respiratory virus. Uh, in a lot of ways, but um, in a lot of other ways, it's not typical. So uh, generally, uh, you know, there's a very uh, heavily um, seasonal dependence upon symptoms uh, for some of the respiratory viruses like influenza and respiratory syncytial virus. 
um, we're not seeing any kind of seasonal relationship with COVID-19. Um, you're just as likely now to get COVID-19 in the in the heat of the summer as you were uh, in the in the dead of winter. So um, it, it it is is not really behaving a lot like um, some of our other respiratory viruses, which really makes it difficult to predict from a public health perspective what the right answer is for a lot of these things. But we knew uh, a, a few things that work and work very effectively. So we know that universal masking is extremely effective. So I can tell you. Uh, that um, here at Lurie Children's Hospital, when we instituted universal masking, so everybody that um, comes to our facility has to wear a mask, um, our transmission from patients to providers or from providers to providers uh, has virtually been eliminated. So um, we've taken care of a number of kids. So as, as I mentioned, about 800 children total uh, on an outpatient basis and probably around 120 kids that have been in, admitted to the hospital. Uh, and we've not had any transmission uh, from those patients with COVID-19 to uh, any of our providers. Uh, and, and a lot of that has been due to universal masking. So really effective and something that I wish uh, more people would uh, routinely adopt. And, and certainly as I walk around the city of Chicago, I, I unfortunately see a lot of people not wearing their mask. Um, but, but we know that this is probably one of the single most effective measures that we can do. Hand washing, really important. Um, I, I think frequent hand washing, uh, using a, an alcohol-based gel is, is just as effective as soap and water, but hand washing frequently, particularly whenever you touch your face uh, or your eyes, uh, is, is really, really important. And, and that's something that um, as kids go back to school, wearing a mask, and frequent hand washing or use of um, those um, alcohol-based gels will be very effective in preventing transmission. And then lastly, the social distancing aspect, we know that that's been effective as well. And I think that's, that's one of the areas where I think it's a little bit more difficult to universally adopt at all of our school systems. Um, and, and I think that's probably why some of these recommendations, again, are going to uh, uh, be specific to your individual school system, and it's, it's your ability to practice social distancing in, in your particular uh, school setting. So this is a slide that we have shared widely. We've shared with um, all of our community pediatricians in the area. It really kind of um, gives you a really good um, breakdown of the risk of transmission of, of disease when everybody is wearing a mask. And, and with um, both uh, an asymptomatic COVID-19 carrier and an uninfected person, uh, if, when they both wear masks, the risk is extremely low. And when they're social distance, it's, it's even lower than that. So um, it, it is really effective and something that um, we continue uh, uh, to preach and say that this is really something that um, if everybody adopted these measures, uh, we'd be in a much different place, I think. Um, these are some helpful resources. Whoops, uh, I'll go back real quick. Um, the the um, Illinois Department of Public Health uh, has recently offered some community guidance for school, which um, is, is a, there's a, a frequently, frequently asked question sheet here, and that's the link, and that's an active link, and it's fantastic. Um, it provides a lot of uh, good information uh, that um, uh, we certainly rely upon here at Lurie, but that we um, have recommended to school systems here in, in our region. Uh, the CDC has also um, some great information. And then finally, the American Academy of Pediatrics. And it really kind of gives you a, a balanced view of the pros and the cons, the risks and the benefits uh, of returning to school in person. Uh, so with that, um, you know, I will uh, answer some questions in the chat room and, and listen to Dr. Walkup and Dr. Larson, and thank you for your attention. Again, it was a pleasure to be here. I think we're uh, changing control to give the control to Dr. Walkup. And I'm unmuted. Yes? Okay, good. Uh, good afternoon. It's great to be here today to talk about uh, kids and COVID and uh, how to move forward with, with schools and families. Um, I, I, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit of a different line 
Um, I appreciate how important school is for kids growth and development, socialization for growth and development. Uh, but I do want to want to have a positive message about um, kids and their capacity to be resilient and to go through tough times and the importance of family context for kids um, as they face uh, challenging circumstances. I think the most important thing to understand is that most kids are going to do well. The kids who are going to struggle the most are kids who have mental health problems to begin with. And in Illinois, about 20% of kids have a mental health problem. Only about half of them get treatment. And recent studies suggest that only 30 to 35% of those kids who are actually in treatment actually get better enough to do well. So that means that we have a large number of kids who have mental health problems. And even if they're in treatment, they're not really going to do very well over the long term. We definitely have to do something about this for, for a state, uh, uh, but also for a nation. We also realize that kids who lose a relative are really going to struggle, whether they have a mental health problem or not. And where there are these devastating circumstances from a financial point of view, an environmental point of view, or a real change in family functioning so that kids really are not in a family uh, context that's going to be caring and supportive for them. The other thing that I worry about is that um, because the elderly are affected and the poor are affected, that I worry about the loss of a generation of elders in many of our communities, as those elders oftentimes hold the culture, they hold um, a standard of behavior um, that, that oftentimes young people look up to. And if we lose that generation to COVID-19, I think we put uh, middle-aged parents and, and younger kids at risk because of the loss of, of their elders in their community. As, as Derek mentioned, uh, all, all decisions are, uh, are, or all politics are local, uh, but ret returning to school is an extremely local issue and it really depends upon many, many factors. Um, but I think it's most important uh, to kind of emphasize what Derek was suggesting and how important masking, hand washing, physical distancing, and being socially transparent with your friends and neighbors about how you're adhering to uh, these standards and working with them so that they adhere to those standards and that we develop a kind of a social trust, if you will, around our, our communal efforts um, to work together to, to prevent the spread of COVID-19. So these are basic principles about kids in general and kids do the very best when they're fully embedded within their families. The family really provides the anchor for all coping and adaptation. Families that align with each other create positive communities. And I think it's important for us all to understand that this will pass and that kids who are okay will be okay going forward. Parents who understand this and step up and, and take on the challenge are going to do well. When they orient themselves to like-minded, well-informed families, their communities are going to do well. That said, we know that there are families and communities that can't or won't take on this challenge. So I think it's very important when we have an opportunity to speak to these issues, to really advocate for adherence to the best practices that Dr. Wheeler pr presented. As I mentioned, the vast majority of kids are gonna do well. It doesn't mean it's gonna look easy for them or that they'll ever forget what they've gone through, but how they manage this is really important because this will set a standard for how they manage and master tough challenges going forward. So it's very important that we not only think about what kids are experiencing, but how they're coping and adapting now, because they will set the stage for how they cope with difficult circumstances in the future. As I mentioned, kids who are doing well will do well in the future. And the parenting strategies that, that they have used, parents have used to get their kids to this place will get them through these difficult times. And as I mentioned, kids who had problems before, those are kids who are at risk going forward because they will incorporate this challenge and problem set into existing challenges and problem sets. 
one of the things that we see happening in difficult situations is we see parents coming together, but we also see parents that tend to polarize around difficult situations. And so what we're really trying to do when we talk with families about managing these difficult circumstances is to find a way for parents and partners to come together in raising their kids and making, and making decisions and moving forward. That polarization can really harden over time unless parents really understand that they have to work together, acknowledge their differences, but come to joint decision making around managing their kids. The other thing that can happen in difficult times is that parents can kind of lose their own capacity to stay center. And we see parents that get confused about what to do, but it's important for them to understand that this creates and reinforces uncertainty in their kids. Parents who are fearful oftentimes default to over-controlling or over-protective behavior. And we know that that's from a parenting strategy is really destructive to kids' growth and development. Some parents feel very guilty about their ability to kind of manage during this hard time. And sometimes it leads to indulgence and loss of structure and discipline within the home. And parents who are distracted by their own fear and worry sometimes just stop parenting effectively. They get irritable, which leads to power struggles with their partners and with their kids. And that kind of difficulty can dominate the home environment and make everything much more complicated. And probably the thing we see most common when parents are really struggling themselves is that kids tend to take over the parenting role and find themselves not only having to take care of themselves, but feeling responsible for taking care of their parents. So the question I get most often is, what should I say to my kid? And I think kids really look to their parents for leadership in time of crisis, but kids really don't care about what parents say. They pay much more attention to how their parents behave. And so it's really important for parents not to just think about what they have to say, but think about how they manage themselves, how they make decisions, how they carry themselves, their personal demeanor speaks more to, to their kids than what the kids actually say, or what parents actually say. Kids need to feel, feel safe and secure, uh, but that feeling of safety and security comes from parental predictability, not necessarily parental um, advice or guidance. So what do you do in difficult circumstances? Uh, moderation is really the key. Being calm, providing simple reassurance, paying attention to how your kids are functioning, both short and long term. And we advocate in these complicated times for people not to look for novel so solutions and not to ask their kid too many questions. Because if you ask your child how they're doing 20 times a day, at some point the kid is going to begin to believe that something is the matter with them. Being there, being present is the most important. And being able to focus on the various domains of your child's inner life is probably the key to kind of having a successful venture through these very difficult times. So the other part that I recommend is instead of talking, pay attention and listen and observe, because kids will often tell you their concerns through their behaviors and the questions that they ask. So when a kid says, um, are we going back to school? That could either mean I never want to go back to school because I've had a great time at home, or I really want to go back to school because I want to be with my friends. But if the parents just ask the answer the question about, are we going back to school? They'll never really understand what motivated the question to begin with. From a, uh, a basic daily living, creating predictability and routine is the antidote to chaos and fear and worry. So stable adult behaviors, stable emotions, providing thoughts that are reassuring, really puts kids in a position to function at their very best during these difficult times. So in that context, parents have to be close enough to be able to observe and listen and understand, but they can't get too close where they find themselves intruding on their youngsters experiencing or provoking emotional reactions, smothering or overprotecting out of fear and worry. This can be done. Parents can do this and have been doing this for years on end. And it's just important for families to understand that these kind of basic parenting um, behaviors are the kinds of things that get kids in a good place and keep them moving forward. 
And uh, we're getting close to the end. Please don't be an outlier. Um, in these very, very difficult times, it's very important to kind of find a middle road and to kind of find other families and other situations where the middle road can really um, move and, and stabilize the situation. Extreme emotions, attitudes, and behaviors during challenging times distract everyone from how to function at their very best when things are really challenging. So parents really shouldn't worry too much. I, I know we've talked a lot about uh, the value of school in socialization and in kids' lives, um, but you have to understand that there are lots of things that change when schools close. Um, many other factors are likely involved in, so, in some of those uh, big impacts that Dr. Wheeler presented earlier. Parents have to take care of themselves first. This is that take, put your own oxygen mask on first. Predictability and routine are the antidotes for fear and insecurity. And whatever you use to get your kids to this good place, um, those are the kinds of things that are get, going to allow you to get your kids through this and to the other side. So with that, I will uh, finish and uh, pass it on to Dr. Larson. Great, thank you so much to the Children's uh, Fund for Research Fund for giving the opportunity to participate in today's discussion. I have the opportunity to present our best practices for return to sports and play during the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 has certainly heightened my awareness of our society's obsession with sports, both the playing and the watching of sports. There is not only a chemical reason why we love sports, but also an emotional one. From a scientific perspective, engaging in a sporting activity releases endorphins and hormones that send pleasure signals to the brain. But the potentially more important positive benefits of sports are the emotional and the social aspects. When school-aged children were asked why they find sports fun, they didn't say it was because they win. They expressed receiving enjoyment from trying their best or getting respect, playing with the team and being active. This reinforces why sports and physical activity is so important to a child's overall health and well-being. Thus, we as physicians encourage children to be active for a cumulative time of at least 60 minutes per day. Being active doesn't necessarily require a formalized team sport. In fact, there are a lot of benefits from individual activities. But of course, team sports do provide increased socialization as well as behavioral development. So when we think about our children returning to sport during this COVID-19 pandemic, we need to weigh the risk benefit ratio of individual versus team sports. Individual sports obviously have the lowest risk of COVID-19 transmission and exposure. The risk of COVID-19 transmission increases with the number of participants involved. For example, football being one of the highest risk sports just due to the number of team members that kids interact with. The spacing of participants is important. Wrestling, of course, is one of the highest risk sports because of the constant contact and close proximity. The frequency of contact of participants. So sports like baseball, lacrosse, and hockey are at high risk in this regard. And sports that are played indoors have a higher risk due to the risk of transmission of aerosolized virus particles. And while the biggest risk of the virus transmission is through the air, contact surfaces and transmission cannot be completely ignored. Thus, sports that have constant skin contact with a ball, such as basketball or volleyball, are at higher risk than sports like baseball or soccer. This risk can be mitigated with the constant disinfecting of equipment surfaces and frequent hand hygiene. But even with these precautions, participation in these sports is not completely risk-free. Thus, the decision to participate in team sports should be made on an individual or family basis. Even though a child may not have medical risk factors, there may be a family member with a higher risk condition that is at risk for COVID-19 transmission from a child involved in a team sports. 
Thus, families with members who have higher risk medical conditions should consider only allowing their children to participate in the lowest risk activities, such as independent skills building activities or attending virtually led coach practices. There's still a lot of value in these independent drill based activities. For example, many golfers have found their golf game improved because they've had to focus more on chipping and putting during the quarantine. Of course, the more competitive the team sport becomes, the higher risk of COVID-19 transmission. The highest risk sports are those with team competitions outside of the city or state, such as travel leagues of baseball, basketball, football, hockey, etc. Oops, excuse me. This is probably the most important slide in my talk since I remain hopeful that at some point all children and families will be able to return to sporting activities by minimizing the risk of COVID-19 transmission and using the appropriate precautions. As you've already heard from Dr. Wheeler, face coverings and masks are the key to your family's protection from COVID-19. And this remains true when participating in sports. So please encourage all coaches, officials, spectators, and volunteers to wear a mask at all times. Participants engaged in the vigorous exercise or active play on the field or court or pitch do not necessarily need to wear a mask. But if the child returns to the dugout the sideline or bench, a mask should be redonned. And daily symptom monitoring is critical to protect the health and well being of all members of the team. This includes taking daily temperatures and monitoring for the symptoms of cough, sore throat, rash, etc. A two week quarantine from sport is needed for all participants or participants with household contacts who do test positive for COVID 19. All of these recommendations that I have discussed today are available on our Lurie Children's website through the Division of Orthopedic Surgery and Sports Medicine. And I have also provided some incredibly helpful links to review as you consider allowing your child to return to sport. I do have two questions that I wanted to address from the list of questions that wasn't specifically outlined in my presentation and I thought were incredibly insightful. One question was related to overuse injuries. We certainly see overuse injuries in kids that are ramping up in activities. And as we think about kids being off sports for a certain duration of time, I think kids will be at increased risk for overuse injuries if they ramp up too quickly. So probably the key to identifying overuse injuries is to prevent them first. So just making sure that kids have adequate rest from activities as well as balanced activities. We don't want kids participating in the same activity or, or sport at all times. Symptoms of overuse activities include pain or soreness. If a child is complaining of pain or soreness greater than 24 hours after a practice or a game, then rest should be the first line treatment. But in kids who don't want to express pain or uh, are fear that they're going to lose playing time, the other things to look out for are a change in mechanics. So in lower extremity sports, this means a change in gait or a limp. In upper extremity sports, such as pitch pitching or overhead throwing, you're looking for a change in mechanics. And we really rely on coaches to help us identify those. If there is, again, a concern for an overuse injury, we do encourage first resting from the activity to see if the symptoms improve. And then, of course, we as the Division of Orthopedic Surgery and Sports Medicine would be happy to see them for further evaluation. Another specific question that I thought was important to address was the socialization with the team. So much of team sports and athletics is done off the field, not just on the field. I was a cross country runner and probably my favorite part of the cross country season was the spaghetti dinners before the big meet. And certainly having 120 girls eating spaghetti dinner in a closed environment is not something that we would recommend right now. But that socialization is important. So um, when able um, and socializing with teammates outside of practices, you, I do recommend just following general safety guidelines. So that means using masks, appropriate social distancing, being outside when able, and limiting the number of people that do get together. 
Some teams have instituted team dinners via Zoom or other virtual uh, ways to be able to interact with each other in a safe environment. So these are again just some of my thoughts. I'd be happy to entertain any of the other questions from the chat room. And again, thank you for your time and attention. Fantastic. I think that brings us to the Q&A portion of our um, panel discussion today. I'll bring Kathy back, but I'll let you know that the presentations were incredibly informative, but I do know that we have a number of questions that were submitted in advance of the panel in an effort to get to as many of those questions as possible and the time of the panel discussion by 10 minutes. Thanks so much for joining us and I'll hand it over to Kathy. Thank you, Christy. And yes, the, the chat questions are on fire here. And I can't thank the uh, individuals who've dialed in, thanking you for all your questions as well. This is certainly a very important topic in our times. And I'm going to go through uh, some of the questions. I'm going to start with Dr. Wheeler. And, and while you've touched on some of this, you know, what are the pediatric health risks associated with re-entering school and what precautions can a family take? You know, you talked a lot about masking, hand washing and social distancing. Clearly people understand those. Are there other factors you'd point out for families? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for that. And I apologize, my computer uh, uh, logged me out automatically for a software update that I tried to, to stop. But, um, you know, I, I think that one of the questions that we received in the chat room had asked uh, if kids could transmit uh, infections to, uh, if, if they were asymptomatic or symptomatic, uh, didn't really matter. And, and I think um, my answer to that on the chat room was that the study that we performed at Lurie Children's would suggest yes, uh, but we really don't know. And I can tell you that there have been a few studies that have looked uh, at that specific question, and some have suggested that most of the kids in, in the these are um, based on experience outside the United States. So um, there's a, a study, a couple studies in China, one in South Korea and one in Italy that looked at this, that most of the kids who um, tested positive for COVID-19, and, and if you remember, most of uh, countries outside of the United States had much more widespread testing than we do here. Uh, but most of the kids who tested positive were tested because they were in um, a family with one family member that had COVID-19. And in general, most of those patients, most of the pediatric patients uh, tested positive after somebody had in their family had tested positive. So I, I don't think we really know for sure, uh, but based on just the biology and, and what we know about other respiratory viruses, I would speculate that yes, kids can transmit uh, and really drives home the importance of masking, uh, hand washing, and, and social, social distancing as much as possible. Thanks very much, Dr. Wheeler. Uh, another question is, uh, and this would probably be for Dr. Wakup or Dr. Wheeler, what percent of the pediatric population is asymptomatic? Is there some data on that? And then understanding this, how can our um, especially older children feel safe? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the question, and I, I thought I tried to answer this a little bit with the, the Lurie and the pre-procedural testing that we have done. I, I think most of the studies would report that um, uh, kids that are tested, uh, you know, if they're asymptomatic, about 2% two, two of those will test positive, 2 to 3% will test positive for COVID-19. Um, it's, it's hard to know exactly what that number is because, again, we don't universally test everybody. Uh, and unfortunately, that, that's related even now, today, uh, going through this pandemic, we um, are, are still having trouble getting testing supplies uh, for COVID-19 testing. Uh, so we're really not in a position where we could universally adopt and test every kid that came in. Um, and, and so we have to be a little bit specific about who we test. Um, I don't know if Dr. Walkup wants to answer the question about uh, uh, your, your second part of the question. He's shaking his head. You're on mute, Dr. Walkup. I think you nailed it, Derek. I, I think the, the idea of safety really comes with the kinds of precautions that you talked about earlier. And, um, and that level of vigilance around 
those precautions and the people with whom you hang out and making sure that they're part of a community that's committed to stopping the spread and, and paying attention to good, good hygiene and, um, and safe practices. Great, thank you. Um, you know, Dr. Wheeler, another question for you uh, relating to viral loads. You definitely talked about the study that was done, but what do you see the next steps to be in understanding the relationship between viral load and, and transmission? Yeah, I think it, we would have to, I mean, it, it, it would require um, case trust, uh, tracing, which, um, you know, I think has been talked about a lot in the literature that we don't have enough individuals to be able to do case tracing. Uh, so, so generally what you would do is if you um, had a pediatric patient that had a high or a low viral load, uh, you would want to look at all of their contacts uh, all of their close contacts to see um, how many of those close contacts would then test positive. Uh, and that study really hasn't been done yet. Uh, not only in the United States, I don't believe uh, that kind of study has been done um, overseas either. So uh, we'll just continue to monitor and have to learn from our experience. <coughs> Excuse me, have to learn from our experience as, as we move forward. Sure. Um, you know, thank you for that answer. You know, clearly further study is needed. And, you know, I'd love to tell the audience that we are going to be hosting a September research event that is focused on pediatric COVID-19 research. And um, we'll have the opportunity to learn more from Dr. Seed on what's going on at Lurie in that area as well. Um, you know, Dr. Larson, I know you covered this, but anything you might want to add um, in the way of best practices for returning to team sports practice uh, during COVID-19? You did a great job of answering all the questions, by the way. Well, I think I would just even emphasize something that Dr. Walkup um, already communicated, <clears throat> and that is that we're in this together. So teams really need to have an open dialogue with each other about what their risk tolerance is as a team, and the more they are transparent about what their activities are on and off the court, um, the better they can understand what their risk is for each other. So really having an involvement in your child's team, knowing the families, um, getting involved can actually help mitigate your risk because then you know kind of who is a risk factor in your bubble. Um, and you know really being a team player off the court so wearing your mask when you're in the grocery store actually protects your child and your child's teammates um, from that exposure risk and so i think the more we work together as a team both on and off the field the better chance we have of getting on the field and playing and have fun together thank you uh, dr walk up uh, lots of parents are asking how they can support their teenage children during these emotional times and really ensuring their resiliency. You know, they're dealing with a lot of change in, in their social lives and, and how they interact with people. Um, again, you know, I, I'm one of those people that believe that children and, uh, and families are naturally resilient unless there is something happening from a mental health point of view within them. And so I expect kids to be resilient and I expect that families on a routine basis through good solid parenting skills facilitate the development of that resilience. I think I talked a little bit about overprotectiveness and I think there's a vulnerability to overprotectiveness and essentially when parents become overprotective, they give the message to their kid that they're at risk and at danger and that they need their parents to take care of them. But I think what I would be hoping for parents to be doing during this time is empowering their kids to become good members of the family, good members of their school community, good members of their sports team by wearing their mask, washing their hands, social distancing when they can, because their happiness, their socialization, their educational future is dependent upon them paying attention to these issues. And, um, you know, families will sometimes talk about younger kids wearing seat belts, right? But somehow, some way, we figure out a way to get them to wear the seat belt. And we find some way to get them to wear a helmet when they're riding a bike. 
wearing a mask and washing your hands is just another developmental challenge that adolescents have to get used to doing and taking care of for them to fully participate with us and keep everyone safe. Thank you very much. Dr. Wheeler, um, a lot of questions about the vaccine, you know, if and when it comes out, you know, how will we know it's safe to give to kids? Because we really don't know what the long-term effects are. And I know that's a tough one to answer, but um, what yeah, are the thoughts? I mean, yeah, it is, it is tough. Uh, you know, I would say, first of all, um, we're waiting desperately for the vaccine, right? So um, uh, I, I think there is a lot of discussion about how best to, to test the safety of the vaccine. I think, um, you know, typically what happens in the United States is uh, vaccines go through uh, phase one, phase two, and phase three trials, um, albeit um, somewhat accelerated. So there are some uh, vaccines that are currently in phase three studies. Uh, a little bit different, I think, think um, there were a lot of reports in the media last week about Russia um, expediting their vaccine uh, and kind of skipping a lot of that. So um, I, I think we have to balance the risks and the potential benefits. Um, and, and so I, I think the Russian approach is probably not the one I would advise. Um, but I think the tra traditional approach that we use for testing vaccine is, is probably not going to work either. Um, so I, I think the sooner that we can get a vaccine online, the better. I think um, the studies of the vaccines that are currently going through phase two and phase three trials are promising. Uh, so that's good news. Um, whether this is a vaccine that is a one-time thing or um, something that's similar to the influenza vaccine where you have to get every year, I, I think remains to be seen. At least some of the studies would suggest that it's probably going to be a, an annual vaccine. So we'll have to wait and see. Great. Thank you for answering a tough one. Um, Dr. Walkup, um, this is more focused on preschoolers and, um, and their safety in school. You know, how do we reassure them if, if for those children that are going to preschool um, that they're going to be safe, especially since we told them, you know, the reason school was canceled in the spring was due to the virus. Yeah, this is, this, is, this is a tough one, and I think it speaks to how three-year-olds listen, learn, and understand, and, um, and it probably isn't by what their parents tell them. It's probably how their parents behave and the kinds of things that parents do to create safety and security within the home, to be cool, calm, and collected as they think about the drop-off at school. Um, as they work with other families at that school to make sure that the school environment is as safe as possible, that kind of parental confidence that they're making the right decision about sending their kid to preschool will be transmitted to a sense of confidence and comfort within that, that preschool child. Thank you. Um, a lot of questions around kind of the long-term potential risks associated with COVID for children, you know coronary issues, immune system issues, asthma. You know, can any of you really comment on, on you know, what we know and, and, and how to manage this very challenging uh, question? Yeah, I'll give it a try. I mean, I, I think um, we don't know a lot about the long-term implications of COVID-19. Uh, I will say that uh, most of our patients uh, who um, have been relatively healthy uh, have had a full recovery. I think uh, even our patients that have had chronic conditions have returned to their baseline pre-COVID state. Um, I think the, the question that, that you're referring to in terms of the coronary artery abnormalities refers to that Kawasaki's-like uh, illness or MISC, uh, multi-inflammatory disease, um, that we're seeing. Uh, again, it's very rare uh, but I think um, the research out on that and our experience with that is is really too early to tell what the long-term implications are of that. So I, I think we'll continue to learn. There's more and more information that comes out every day on that particular aspect. Um, and it's interesting, we're not seeing a lot of that here in Chicago. Uh, it seems to be uh, more on the coasts uh, mm -hmm. of, of uh, California and New York where they're seeing more of that. Um, and there's um, some speculation from uh, some investigators at Northwestern 
uh, that have suggested that there could be a little bit of a different strain of this virus. And the one that we're seeing here in our local market is more consistent with uh, what was seen in China. Uh, whereas the uh, ones that we're seeing in um, California and New York are more consistent with the virus strains that we're seeing in Spain and Italy, where uh, the disease was uh, seemed to be much more severe. So who knows? I, I think we'll learn more as, as time will tell. I have one comment on that as well. Um, not in terms of kids who get the coronavirus, but just the quarantine. And then of course the, the pandemic itself has changed activity levels in kids. And long-term data will be more instructive, but we definitely saw an initial decrease in the rate of fractures that we saw in kids just because they weren't as active as they were before. I do think there may be some long-term consequences of decreased activity. Activity, however, related to obesity um, and deconditioning, and then maybe an actual uptick in injuries related to not being active. Um, time will tell on that. So I guess, again, my encouragement to families is keep your kids active, especially here in Chicago, while the weather is still nice, get them outdoors with the appropriate safe precautions to hopefully mitigate some of the long-term uh, side effects of being less active. That's a, that's a great point. Derek, Dr. Derek, is there any reason to believe that a kid who's a carrier could have complications or sequelae, uh, or an asymptomatic kid, I should say, would have complications and sequelae if they were never ill? Uh, not based on what we're seeing either in adults or, or kids. I, I don't think so. Um, again, this, this is a really strange virus. I mean, it's unlike any respiratory virus that we've had uh, experience with. Um, it, it, it behaves very differently. Certainly, we have not seen the level of, um, you know, complications uh, uh, from the, uh, this virus that we see in other viruses. So, uh, you know, I, I think it remains to be seen, but um, I suspect based on the experience so far, uh, you know, if you're asymptomatic, not only, you know, if you're infected with the virus, you develop Im uh, immunity, uh, to the virus, but um, uh, the incidence of, of, you know, at least complications three or four months afterwards um, are, are, are few. Thank you so much for all answering that. Um, Dr. Waka, uh, do you know how wearing a mask a full school day will affect the children regarding well-being, concentration, and social interaction? We were just talking about this the other day. Uh, about kind of how, what you can learn about another person when half of their face is covered up. And how much does that actually impact kind of what we learn about them? And when we went around, everybody thought it would be a big deal. But then everybody had an anecdote about looking at someone with a mask and being able to read their facial expression through the mask. Mm -hmm. And so I tend to think, again, I'm one of those people who, who believe that kids are resilient they figure stuff out. Um, and, and again, I hope we can get back to never having to wear masks. But in the meantime, kids have to wear masks. And I think kids will figure out how to socialize with masks safely as long as everything else is okay. And I believe that you can kind of read people's facial expression even with a mask on. Um, maybe, maybe I should put mine on now just, just so people can kind of get a sense of how I'm thinking and feeling. Because there's a lot happening in my face up here if, if, if I was to push the point. Well, Dr. Walkup, as a surgeon, I spend the majority of my day in the OR in a mask. And I can tell you that we have outstanding communication in masks uh, and we don't take them off all day long. So to second your point, I do think that there is effective communication even when wearing, wearing a mask and we do that in some of the most high risk situations such as in the operating room. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Wheeler, what kind of guidelines should children that are immunocompromised adhere to and or their siblings that live with them uh, when schools open, you know, for those kids that go back? Yeah, that, uh, that's a tough question. I mean, these are all really, really yeah. good questions. Um, and, and, you know, we're answering them with, with not a ton of evidence. I would say that we've learned a lot more than we did. But, um, I, you know, I, I think the, the speculation is, is that kids that are immunocompromised are certainly at a higher risk. 
Um, if you look at the adult data, um, you know, it seems that patients with uh, high blood pressure, obesity, and diabetes are the ones that are most at risk um, mm -hmm. in, in terms of d disease severity. Um, you know, I, I, I would say that you have to be cautious, you know, and I think certainly we've had some of our own providers and staff here at the hospital that um, have uh, elected to work from home because of they, you know, they either have close family members uh, with, um, you know, some degree of immunocompromise or they themselves um, have a, a disease or a, a, a treatment that they're immunocompromised. Um, it, it's, it's tough to answer. I would say caution is warranted, but, um, you know, I, I, I can't give you any firm guidelines one way or the other on that. Okay. Thanks very much. Dr. Walkup, um, what do I do if I begin to see behavior changes in my child? You know, you talked a lot about, um, you know, parents showing good examples, but what would be the next step? Um, you know, and at what point do I seek medical help? You know, you know, when would they call you or reach out to someone like you? Yeah. So, um, I, um, I, I, many families have an accountant, they have a lawyer, they have a religious leader. I think every family, especially if there's a family history of mental health problems, every family should probably have a mental health provider that they kind of are in contact with. And I have, in my career, done what we call well baby checks when there's a strong family history of anxiety or depression or other kinds of problems. And so I, I encourage people to get on top of these issues early, to uh, identify risks that are obvious within the families, if you will. Mm -hmm. And the other part is that we know when the psychiatric disorders present themselves over time. So autism presents before age three, ADHD presents between four and seven, the anxiety disorders present between six and 12, depression has its first onset in the mid teenage years. Those are the big mental health conditions. And if you have a positive family history for any of those, you also know when to look for them to start. And the best person to have that relationship or have that discussion with initially is your pediatrician. And once you have that discussion with your pediatrician and you learn about where you are in terms of your family and how people are currently doing, then you're in a much better position to kind of move forward um, with confidence in terms of managing whatever mental health problem may, may arise. Right. And I'm gonna end with one final question, um, again for Dr. Walkup. Um, and it's, it's more on a positive note, it's about returning to normality. And, and this question um, says, some children have flourished during this time with pandemic, eliminating commuting, morning rush, peer pressure, need to perform at sports or other activities beyond academics. How do we help them transition back to normal, which will hopefully be soon? Um, you know, one of, one of my pediatrician colleagues said that the socially anxious kids love COVID-19 because they don't have to go out and meet people anymore. And the depressed kids have the most trouble because they're pent up with their families feeling blue all the time. Um, for those kids who have to get back into action again, for some of them, it is going to be a bit of a struggle. They like being at home with their parents. They like that lower expectation set. Uh, we're hearing a lot about sleep phase problems where kids and parents are up all night and then sleep till one or two o'clock in the afternoon. Those kinds of things are really gonna to be tough to switch over time. And so I think about how you begin to just move in general. So I love the idea of individual sports, getting out as much as possible. You know, this is the time to take up golf and tennis. Uh, begin to express yourself in the outside world so that you're not going from the cocoon back into the, to the robustness of a, of a complex world again. And so really through graded exposure, if you will, to an advancing agenda with being in the world and participating in activities is really the thing that we can start today to get kids ready for tomorrow. Thank you so much for your great answers. I know they're tough questions and um, I will hand it over to Christy to close. Thank you so much, Kathy. And, and I join you and everyone on the Children's Research Fund board 
um, in thanking our partners at Lori Children's for sharing their insights with us um, during this incredibly unprecedented un and uncertain time. Um, I thank you too for all the people that joined us today for the past hour. I really hope that you found this in uh, session informative and I hope that it helps guide you in the days and months ahead. Um, as I think we've talked about in the chat, a recording of the session will be shared with you in the coming days, and I would encourage you to please feel free to share it with your colleagues and your family and your friends. Um, and I'm happy to share on the next slide um, of our upcoming research sessions. So thanks to support from individual and co corporate donors, our research education champions, next month we'll be launching Research in Focus, our series on research education. The September session will focus on important pediatric COVID-19 research and will feature Dr. Patrick Seed, Lori Children's Division Head of Infectious Disease and the Children's Research Fund Chair in Basic Science Research at the Manny Research Institute. Watch for an email next week with the opportunity to join this session. And once again, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you all stay well. Thank you.